Welcome. My name is Tony Rubinier. Today's uh, workshop is on deliberate practice for psychotherapists. Um, who here has just heard the term deliberate practice before, just in any context? Okay, great. Um, so a little about me. I, uh, uh, I have a small private practice in uh, Seattle and clinical faculty at the University of Washington. The information for today's workshop is from these three books. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to make the slides from today's workshop available if you want them for your own writing, your own research, your own presentations, however you want to use them, okay? So if you want them, just send me an email. That's my email there, or Jennifer knows my email as well. And uh, I'm happy to send you uh, the slides. And uh, this website has more information as well. And they so. have really good videos too, I watched them. Oh, cool, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I put a bunch of videos on there. Um, we, have, we have three hours today that we really don't need the full three hours, all right? So uh, we'll do some, we'll take a good break, we'll come back, do more. We probably will end a bit early, um, but you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes, all right? Um, about you, so... Uh, Raise your hand if you're a trainee, graduate student, okay, any faculty in the room? Okay, excellent, great. That means we can speak freely. Uh, <laughs> raise your hand if you're uh, seeing clients currently, okay. Uh, it, it, raise your hand if you're in the clinical program, Count, any counseling program, it's all clinical in here, okay. Um, and raise your hand if you're in your first year, Second year, third year, or later? Okay, later, okay, <laughs> awesome. Um, and uh, raise your hand if you use psychodynamic therapy ever at all. CBT ever at all? Work with kids? Families? Okay. I actually ask for cultural reasons. Uh, I go around and do this workshop around the country and around Europe and elsewhere, and uh, I found that Therapists use different language depending on what models they've been trained in. So I, I want to use language that's accessible to you, even though we're all typically struggling with the same challenges. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask you to participate, especially, you know, we have a nice small group here, so if you have any questions, raise your hand. Even if I'm in the middle of, like, yapping, I want to privilege your questions, okay? Um, I'm going to start with a uh, kind of a brief lecture about the practice. We're going to do a video demonstration. Um, we're going to move into a, a live demonstration. Is it Jabin? Jabin has volunteered very bravely. I, I promised her minimal blood, <laughs> so my injury rate is going down every year. So uh, I'm happy to report. Um, and uh, Taz made it through uh, this morning without injury, so it's good. Uh, and then we're going to have lots of time for Q and A and discussion. So, whoops, there we go. So before we get to deliver practice, I'd like to speak for a moment about um, what brought me to this field. Uh, so who knows what movie this is? Goodwill. Goodwill. Goodwill Hunting, great. And uh, uh, raise your hand if you've seen the movie. I, I'm not sure if people still see this movie. I, you know I'm kind of old, so, okay. But th this character in the movie is a therapist. That's his client. Matt Damon's the client. Anyone know who this gentleman is? Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Okay, so he plays the therapist. He does an amazing job. And when I started graduate school, my vision was to become something like Robin Williams in Good Will Hunting. Uh, I wanted to help my clients have these breakthroughs, uh, achieve these unlockings of their potential, realize their, uh, their, have insights about what's been holding them back, all these things. The good news is that I was able to help a fair amount of my clients. Some of them responded very quickly to therapy. But as my training went on, I started to get the nagging feeling that I was not helping all of my clients. And I started to collect my own outcome data. You guys use the OQ45, right? So congratulations on that. Uh, you might not realize it, but you're kind of at the forefront of the field. There's a lot of training programs that do not collect outcome data. Uh, and so your ability to look at your own data is really valuable. 
uh, when I was in my training program at my practicum, uh, I asked my supervisor if I could start collecting outcome data. And she was like, okay, well, I have to ask my boss. And I had a great supervisor, uh, very supportive. We worked, I was in the community mental health. <coughs> this was in San Francisco, so this is like this huge, you know, bureaucracy. She asked her boss, her boss asked his boss, his boss asked the lawyer, and the lawyer said no. Can anyone guess why? Liability. Liability. Yeah, the lawyer said, well, if something goes wrong, we don't want a record of it. So, you know, that's the makes sense from a lawyer's perspective, but I'm like, from my perspective. So you know what I did is I took one of those dry erase boards and I used a marker to create my own outcome measure. I, I copied the, it's called the outcome rating scale. It's like a much simpler form of the OQ. And I put it on the dry erase board so my clients could fill it out every week with a dry erase marker. And I could kind of keep my, copy it to my own secret data and then erase it. And so it was black market data. <laughs> <laughs> So consider yourselves lucky. So over time, I added up this black market data, and to my horror, I realized that I was not helping a fair amount of my clients. And I kind of aggregated it. In fact, about half of my clients were not improving. A fair amount uh, were stalling, which means even though it would seem like therapy was going well, even though like if you read a transcript, it would seem good, the clients, were, their symptoms were not improving. They were just kind of flatlined. A fair amount of them dropped out. Has anyone here ever had a dropout? Maybe you've read about it in a book? <laughs> uh, it's not a pleasant experience. I put 20% there. Actually, some weeks it felt like quite a bit more than 20% dropped out. Uh, and then about 10% of my clients deteriorated during treatment, which means their symptoms got worse. This was probably the hardest for me to stomach, that I felt the most guilty about. Um, you know, because I really wanted to help people. I didn't go to graduate school in psychology to become like really rich or whatever. You know what I mean? Like we get into this because we care about people, we want to help people. And so it's kind of heartbreaking when we can. Um, now, when I first discovered this, I was frankly horrified and ashamed. And I didn't tell anyone. No one else was talking about it. You know, my supervisors weren't talking about their outcome data showing dropouts, deterioration. When I read like the CBT book by Beck or whatever, he wasn't talking about his dropouts and deteriorations. Like everyone was just talking about how confident they were, or how empirically validated they were, or whatever, you know? And so I was embarrassed, but then I started to read the outcome literature from across the field, and you find that these outcomes are actually quite average that if you take kind of all the therapist outcomes together, all the trainees as well, kind of aggregate it, this is roughly the averages you'll find. So I was an average trainee. Something I'd like to emphasize before we move on is that there are many medical professionals that would love to have these outcomes. All right? If you go get a medical treatment for cancer or any number, of tough medical challenges, you will often not have a prognosis this good. All right? And that's for treatments that are much more expensive, much more invasive, much higher risk of side effects. So I think it's important that we feel good about what we are able to do. Any questions about this? Okay. I wanted to do better. How do you become a better therapist? Two of the methods I uh, tried were a lot of reading. I imagine a lot of you have done a fair amount of reading as part of your graduate program. And attending a lot of classes and workshops. These were really good for teaching me the models of therapy, the theories of therapy. I got really good at um, talking therapy. I could write really good therapy. Uh, I could debate with my friends, what's better, CBT, psychodynamic? And it would sound like I knew what I was talking about. But if you watched a video of me doing therapy, it would be totally different. Has anyone had a similar experience? Where your cognitive or declarative knowledge of therapy starts to surpass your procedural ability to do it. Mm -hmm. Particularly with clients that 
you know, might make you feel like frustrated or confused or whatever. Right? It just kept growing and growing. And the further I got in graduate school and beyond, it just kept growing and growing and growing. Right? And th this was quite disconcerting. The, the method of training that I relied on perhaps the most is clinical supervision. Now, I presume everyone in here is in supervision. Mm -hmm. Is anyone in here providing supervision? Even like peers? To peers? Yeah. Great. Peer, raise your hands if you're providing peer supervision. Great. Have you found it to be easy? <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little hard, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I, I've done some research on supervision, and one thing you find researching it is it's one of the very few points of agreement across the field. So you know, our field loves to argue what's the best model of therapy, blah, blah, blah. But every model of therapy agrees that clinical supervision, whoops, I am not on the right slide. Okay. That clinical supervision is a essential, if not the essential, method of clinical training. Right? So if you go to the, the leaders of the major models of therapy and say, you get to pick only one method of training. Welcome. I bet all of them would say clinical supervision. Right? In fact, the only people who question the effectiveness of clinical supervision are supervision researchers. Because we've looked at the data. And we have found that uh, while supervision can help, it does not reliably help. All right? And, hi, welcome. Uh, can you just tell me where you are uh, in, uh, are, are you a professor? Yes. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, unfortunately, no, I'm still a student. Student, okay, what year of training? Third year clinical. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> I just, because I, I like to aim the workshop to, you know, who's here with me. Great. Um, so, uh, we found, now, clinical supervision can reliably impact trainees in both positive and negative ways. We have not shown that clinical supervision reliably helps the trainees' clients. Does that make sense? So if we're measuring it by the trainees' clients, okay? There's mixed data. Uh, Jennifer Callahan has some great studies showing that it can help clients, and some of us have you know, shown otherwise at different sites. So it really depends where you are, the supervisors, that kind of thing. Uh, I personally noticed a, kind of a problematic pattern that I was getting into in supervision, where I would bring a challenge to my supervisor, they would give me the right advice, I was very open to their advice, I'd write it down, but then when I went and sat with my client, I was unable to implement it. I want to give you an example. Um, I had a client who, uh, maybe middle-aged man, uh, was referred by, uh, by his physician for uh, alcoholism. And everyone else was trying to get him into therapy. You know, his wife, his boss, all that kind of stuff. He shows up for therapy, and he just says straight up, everyone thinks I have a drinking problem, but I don't. You know, they all have a problem. So I know I have to be here, I'll be here, because everyone wants me to be here, but I think this is pointless. I found myself arguing with him, trying to convince him that he had a drinking problem. Can anyone guess how effective that was? Not terribly effective. Arguing is not really what's indicated for someone uh, in that situation. Luckily, he was very collaborative. At the end of the session, he was very open and told me that uh, therapy was not helpful at all for him. Uh, I took the video of the session and I brought it to my supervisor. My supervisor was very friendly, very patient, very gentle. He said, oh, Tony, looks like you're arguing with your client. Arguing is really not indicated when someone's at a pre-contemplative state of change. You know, how about we talk about some motivational interviewing techniques? Anyone here done, learned or about motivational interviewing? Great, it's fairly common these days. It's great for situations like this. You know, I absorbed everything the supervisor was telling me, I agreed with it all. MI makes a lot of sense, you know, at face value. Wrote it all down, studied it, read some MI books, went, sat down with the client. 10 minutes into the next session, I was arguing with the client. At the end of the session, he uh, told me it was not very helpful. 
I brought a video back to my supervisor. The supervisor was, tried to be very gentle. He's like, oh, Tony, <laughs> looks like you're arguing with the client again. I'm like, I know, I know, I know, what can I do? Supervisor suggests, anyone know the term counter-transference? Okay, also known as experiential avoidance in the more CBT behavioral crowd. Supervisor suggested, Tony, maybe you're having some you know, counter-transference, experiential avoidance. You know, because I have some addiction stuff in my background, and so, you know, sitting with someone who's in like denial is kind of, you know, uh, uh, evocative for me. I'm like, okay, great. So I kind of think about that. I write it all down. Sit down with a client next week, and I end up arguing again. And this happened week after week after week. Even though my brain knew exactly what to do and what not to do, it's like my body couldn't do it. Has anyone had a similar experience? Yes, Chippy? Yes. <laughs> Can you describe it's about it? About the kind that I'm going to talk about. Ah, so. Great. Excellent. Okay, so we'll save that because yes. we're going to do that. <laughs> anyone else had a similar experience? Yes? Yeah, I, I had a client who, again, had similar, like, pulled similar reactions from me out to Yeah. She was very confrontational. Yeah. And I found myself um, as like her way of avoiding talking about the trauma. And I found myself collaborating with her like six weeks in a row. Like, Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Even though I bet your supervisor was like, oh, time to do it. Now, when your supervisor would point this out, were you, did you agree with your supervisor? Oh, yeah, okay. So you were not like resisting supervision no, or whatever. No, I, I, I knew, and yeah. it took me a while to figure out when it was happening. Yeah. My Great. So, um, uh, was this what? What's the name of the, the woman who developed uh, uh, the cognitive processing? Uh, FOA. Is this FOA's? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, Edna FOA has done similar stuff. Yeah, that's it. Okay, but it involves exposure, and she's written about how she'll go to like VAs or training programs and do these huge elaborate you know, implementations where they do all this training and everyone gets rated at, you know, competent. And then when they sit down with their client, they do every part of exposure therapy except for the exposure. Right? It, can, can you guess why? Any ideas why? Why would a therapist have trouble kind of doing an exposure? Particularly if the client was that means us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's an exposure for two people. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. So what they're basically presuming is that you're just going to be totally fine yourself emotionally, psychologically with the exposure, which is frankly ridiculous. Right? I mean, I mean, and this is, typically it's exposure to like, you know, like, oh, I got a parking ticket. It's not like that. <laughs> you know, it's like really traumatic material. Right? And they're not providing any training for you to tolerate that. Much less stay like adherent, you know, stay focused, stay compassionate, stay all these other things you gotta do. Right? I mean it, it's kinda like if you learn to be firefighters uh, just out of a book and you never actually rehearsed it. And in fact it's even worse. I mean, so firefighters have the luxury, let's say there's a, a house on fire. Firefighter runs in. There's a person in there. They just grab the person, right? If the person's like, I don't want to leave, they don't care. <laughs> They're not going to debate it with you. They like grab you, throw you over the shoulder, and run out, right? And they'll deal with it later, right? We don't have that luxury, okay? We go into the burning building. We meet the person there. As the fire's all around us, we say, hi, I'm Tony. I'm your therapist. Nice to meet you. Would you like to leave the building? And very likely, they might say like, oh, I've had bad experiences through that door. I don't want to go through that door. Okay, there's another door. Would you like to go through there? No, I, I don't like the people who live in that direction. Okay, here's this window. We could jump out the window and you know my colleagues will catch us on that bouncy thing. No, I'm scared of heights. How would you like to leave the burning building? Well, I kind of think I might be exaggerating it. You know, I, you know, my friend said it's in my mind. Maybe the house really isn't burning. Okay, so we sit down. We spend a few months forming a relationship as the building is burning down around us, and then negotiate ways to get out of the building. This, this is real. I, I'm not exaggerating. You might have noticed this. 
right? People come to us in extreme distress, but often feel very ambivalent about solutions. And it's not because they're doing anything wrong or whatever, it's just how we are as human beings. We are the only field that I've been able to identify that has to sit with and tolerate our clients' distress for prolonged periods without doing everything we can to just make it stop. Right? Firefighters, doctors, police, ER personnel, they get to just make the pain stop. Consensual or non-consensual. All right? We actually have to sit with the client eye to eye and attune with their pain. They're watching us for two seconds of misattunement. And we have to just do it in this open-ended way that could go on potentially for years. And clients often report that's the most helpful part of therapy, is someone really sat with me and listened to me and attuned with me and took me seriously. So it's kind of nuts that we're being expected to do this without the training. Anyways, thank you for bringing that up. That's a great example. So. Um, Let's, uh, let's talk about deliberate practice. So, who here uh, has played a sport? What sports? Just yell them out. Mm -hmm. Tennis? Basketball. Basketball. Hockey. Soccer. Hockey. Hockey. Great. Here's a thought experiment. Imagine you went to your coach, so your tennis coach, soccer, hockey coach. He said, coach, I, I love this sport. I love soccer. I, in fact, I want to play professionally one day. I think I got an act for this. But I also, I just want to be totally upfront. I don't have time to practice. I like work, <laughs> I got school, I got my family, I just can't do it. So instead of practicing, uh, how about I play 2,000 hours of soccer matches? 2,000 hours of uh, tennis or hockey games. And we'll meet once a week. We can videotape them, talk about it. You can give me some supervision. So over two or three years, I can get 2,000 hours of supervised uh, performance. Would that turn you into a professional athlete? Professional level skill. I sense some <laughs> skepticism in the room. <laughs> Do you think you could find any coach who would agree to that? No. I mean, you'd be laughed out of the room, right? I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't even be. Okay. Now, how many of you would think psychotherapy is easier than soccer? Or easier than tennis? Do you sit around in your psychotherapy sessions being like, oh my gosh, this is so easy, it's so obvious what I'm supposed to do. Why do we have to go through all this training? <laughs> okay. My experience in training was the opposite. I kept looking for additional outside training because I was like, I really need to learn how to do this and it's so much harder than I expected it to be. Um, isn't it interesting that for sports, it would be inconceivable to become a professional without going through many more hours of practice than performance. While you can get licensed here in Texas with 2,000 hours-ish, of supervised performance and zero practice. Who here has played a musical instrument? What instruments? Yeah. Piano. Piano. Clarinet. Clarinet. Guitar. 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 Anyone else? Saxophone. Saxophone. Mm -hmm. Violin. Violin. Flute. Flute. Great. Thought experiment. Imagine going to a music teacher. I want to be a professional violinist. I want to be a professional uh, flautist. Is that right? Did I say it right? <laughs> um, but I want to be totally honest, I don't have time to practice. I just, you know, my life is just so busy, I got this new job. How about instead of practicing, instead of practicing, I do 2,000 hours of uh, flute performance. 2,000 hours of piano performance, recitals. And you can supervise me every week for a few years. Would that get you to a professional level music ability? Would it get you close to professional level? Where you would think you could really hold your own in an orchestra? When I mention this to professional musicians, their reaction is fear. <laughs> uh, I know a woman who works for the National Symphony in DC, 
And she says if she goes one day without practicing, she can tell the difference. If she goes two days, her colleagues can tell the difference, and three days, the audience. And she's at the top of her career, right? Now, how many of you think your musical instruments, or sorry, how many of you think that psychotherapy is a lot easier than learning these musical instruments? Isn't it interesting? Because this is our training model for psychotherapy. It's a few thousand hours of supervised experience. Now you guys have a few advantages here, uh, which we're going to talk about a bit in terms of videos and outcome measures, but you're still using the same basic model training that we've all used since Freud. The same basic model. You, you do the work performance and then you get supervised on it. Right? If you go to a hardcore CBT training program, they're going to teach you the way Freud taught his students. Same method. Any questions so far? Okay. Deliver practice is a term coined by Kay Anders Erickson and other psychologists in the field of expertise. They study how do uh, performers become competent, then expert, then maintain that across a career. They went to a music conservatory in uh, Germany and they asked classical violinists to record their training activities. They then aggregated all the data and they tried to identify any training activities that reliably predicted the skill of the violinist. And they found only one. It was a number of hours the violinist had practiced. Does that surprise anyone? I have yet to meet anyone who was surprised by that. In fact, they found that the best violinists had engaged in over 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. Has anyone heard the term uh, the 10,000 hour rule? So it was coined by Malcolm Gladwell in the book Blink. He suggested you need over 10,000 hours to become an expert. Now that has been disputed, including disputed by Erickson, who did the original study. There's nothing magic about the number 10,000. Some people it's less, some people it's more. I could never become a professional musician even with 10,000 hours of experience because I'm a little tone deaf. I just, it's not gonna happen, right? Someone else, maybe Bach or Mozart could do it with like 1,000 hours, I don't know. But suffice to say, for most people, it takes thousands of hours of rehearsal to get to a professional level of ability. Deliver practice uh, can be thought of as having five major components. The first is observing work. So uh, you all have an advantage here because your, your sessions are videotaped, right? And you can watch the videotapes with your supervisors. So, uh, so that's really good. You're kind of on the forefront there. The next step is expert feedback. You're getting that from your supervisors. The third step is something we don't do so well in psychotherapy, which is setting small learning goals. We tend to talk about big concepts like, um, what, what does it, how about you tell me? So what's a piece of advice your supervisor has given you just in the past few weeks? Can people yell them out? DBT might work here. DBT. So like, so like, what did that DBT might work? So might use work. DBT. Great. <laughs> so you mean like a client DBT might be appropriate? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. It's a great piece of advice, and it could be true. It could be true. Absolutely. It, and it is incredibly broad. <laughs> DBT is a collection of many skills, each of which could be divided into many other skills. Mm -hmm. So it's a great example of broad, uh, possibly accurate, but very hard, very hard, not very actionable. Other advice people have gotten from their supervisors? Explain client how some of the things were out of client's control and some things that are in their control and they can change that? Great, so uh, help the client identify what's in their, um, what's that called? The, uh, uh, there's a term for that, right? Locus of control. Locus of control, that's it, thank you. Uh, the further I get from graduate school, the less <laughs> anything that would show up on the EPPP is kind of gone. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so great. So that's also great advice, but very broad, mm -hmm. right? Like kind of how, what would be more specific advice is when the client is talking about their sister doing something they don't like, how can we help identify the client's locus of control in that specific relationship? Right? Any other advice people have gotten from the supervisors? Work on the client's 
self-esteem. Great, <laughs> work on the client's self-esteem. So this is also great advice, right? And it could mean like a hundred different things, yep. <laughs> <laughs> right? So more specific would be uh, when the client is uh, talking uh, about um, getting rejected from a job and they start to slump, ask them how they're experiencing right then and maybe reframe their thoughts or discuss their feelings or whatever model you're using. Right? Okay. Small learning goals. When you're learning soccer, your coach doesn't say, uh, try to score more. So that is good advice, <laughs> right? Your coach says, when you're in this specific play and there's two players there and you know your teammate is there, try to kick with an extra like 20 degree angle on your foot. And then we're gonna rehearse that 20 times. All right? Or when you're learning a musical instrument, right? Your teacher doesn't say, try to play louder. They would say, when you hit this particular note, try to hit it just a little harder. Right, and then, and then you can practice that. Okay. Any questions about this? So the fourth step is behavioral rehearsal, and that's typically we, something we do very, very little of in psychotherapy. Though in most other fields, that's where most of the training happens. So uh, who, who played soccer here? When, when you learned a complicated play, how many times would you have to rehearse it to feel like confident? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> like it's hard to even think of how many, yeah. right? And the more the better, yeah. and like right? Multiple weeks. Multiple weeks. Yeah, you just keep going. You just keep hammering at it, right? Hammering at it, right? You know, we're sending you in to do very complicated plays with your clients, like these exposures, without almost no rehearsal, right? How much have you rehearsed doing exposures? Like in a role play or something. In a role play, probably um, maybe three hours total. Three hours. Okay. So, how comfortable would you feel a complicated, tough soccer play with three hours of rehearsal? It wouldn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you wouldn't really expect to be good at it, yeah. right? And if you weren't good at it, you wouldn't like feel like there's something wrong with you. You'd just be like, well, I mean, <laughs> what do you expect? <laughs> I haven't rehearsed it, right? Okay. Um. The fifth step is assessing performance. Now this is a little trickier. It's a little harder in psychotherapy than soccer, or even music. Uh, fortunately, you're collecting outcome data. Something you can do, and I would encourage you to do, is at the end of each year, aggregate your outcome data, or the end of every few years, and just see how you're doing at an aggregate level. Now you have to be really careful to not draw misconclusions from this. Okay, you, you want to be careful to not compare yourself to other people or whatever, because each client group is different, and the results, your results, will be heavily dependent by the client variables. But it can be a way for you to get some kind of empirical sense of how you're doing. Okay, I do this. I collect all my outcome data, and uh, every year or two, I uh, update. I put it on my website, and uh, I update it. Thanks. website and this is my outcome data starting the private practice 2011 and it's kind of going and I'm about to update it again for 2018 and and then I, I worked with a, a graphic uh, designer to kind of create this chart to show this is a snapshot of one year outcome data like people who improved a little a lot deteriorated that kind of thing and uh, I put this on my website just because I think it's, I think the public, as a healthcare provider, I think the public has a right to access this kind of thing. But it's also really helpful for me. On days where I think I'm doing horribly, it helps me stay, and days when I think I'm doing like amazing, like I'm God's gift to clients, like it helps keep me grounded. <laughs> so it's kind of leveling. Uh, any questions about this process? 
Um, we're going to move into a video demonstration pretty soon, but something first I want to highlight. One way that deliver practice is different than traditional training is it's failure facing. I'll read this quote in case you can't read it. You want to know the difference between a master and a beginner. The master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. All right? Have you guys heard the term competence? I'm guessing you have. <laughs> Right? And your job is to prove that you're competent. Right? It's kind of nuts what we ask you to do. You know, you meet your supervisor, they're like, hi, you know, I'm Dr. Ruben here. I'm going to be your supervisor. Uh, at the end of the semester of the year, I'm going to use my subjective judgment to decide whether you should proceed in your career or not. So I want you to come in every week and show me your worst mistakes. <laughs> I mean, it's nuts. <laughs> right? And they've done a lot of research showing that it's like 97% or something of trainees withhold stuff from the supervisor. I mean, I know I did, right? Even though I had great supervisors, I was very fortunate. It's just crazy to, you know, because they have incredible subjective judgment on whether you're doing well or not. So, uh, ideally there would be a separate person, like a separate skills coach who you could go to for rehearsing and skills coaching, where you wouldn't have to worry about them evaluating. You know what I mean? I, I, I think supervisor is not necessarily the right role to also be coach. Uh, but here we are. One thing we're doing with deliver practice is we're trying to flush out all the mistakes that we can. So you have them before you're sitting with your client. Right? It's just like practicing music or sports or whatever. Questions about that? Okay, let's go into this video here. So I just want to show you what deliver practice looks like. So this is, and then after this we're going to take a break, all right? This is my, uh, my old private practice and my old office in Seattle. I had a referral of a client who's referred for depression, symptoms of depression. Came in, it seemed like things were starting well. We had a, built a, seemed like a good alliance, we had agreement on the tasks and goals of therapy, but uh, the outcome data, I was using the OQ45, just like you guys are, showed that he was not improving. And then he started to get worse. Right, and the OQ up his worse. And he, uh, it flagged him at risk of deterioration. So, um, I, uh, video, I still videotape my sessions brought a videotape to a consultant. He's not a supervisor because I'm licensed, so he's a consultant. Showed the video. My consultants noticed almost right away something I just totally missed, that the client was disassociated. Does anyone know what disassociation is? It also can be called depersonalization. Can you describe a, what does it look like when someone's disassociated? Distant. Uh, he, this uh, client in particular had glassy eyes. He, so he was looking at me and kind of engaging me, but also kind of like not there. Uh, you know, dissociation is fairly common in people who survive traumas, that kind of stuff. It can look like depression, because typically there's low energy, but it's typically an anxiety response. It's because the anxiety is so high, someone just checks out. Right? Now, it was kind of shocking when my consultant pointed this out because I, I know about disassociation. I can teach about it. I, I understand what it is, but I totally was missing it with this client. So I set up a deliberate practice exercise for myself where I would rehearse using a somatic based anxiety regulation technique with this client. Has anyone studied somatic? oriented therapies at all. We'll, we'll see if you recognize this. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to play a video of the client there, like you would in supervision, and you're going to see me rehearsing what to say to the client. All right? We'll see if you can hear this. And so right now, just where physically did you feel this anxiety in your body? Can you hear that? And so just right here, just where physically do you notice this anxiety of your body? And 
Okay, so just right now in your body, where do you physically notice the anxiety? So, I just hit play on the video. I am not interacting with the dialogue in the video. Okay? Like in the video, we're probably, we just started a session. I don't know what I would have said, like, great to see you. How are you feeling this week? Or what do you want to work on today? Or something like that. I am using the video as a stimulus to spark an emotional, psychological response in me that'll be similar to sitting with the client. This is called state-dependent learning. Has anyone heard that term? Okay. So to use the fireman metaphor, I am, re gonna, I am rehearsing skills in front of a fire. It's not the same as a real fire, but at least it's something. Yes? Are you saying you're watching tape of prior interaction with him? Yep. And then responding and practicing how you would respond? Is that what you mean? Uh, so I am not responding to what he is saying in session. But you're like practicing what you would based off watching previous yes. sessions. Uh, well, so what? I, next time I sit down with this client, I want to use these anxiety regulation techniques with him. And so I'm rehearsing. And I'm using the video as a stimulus to make me uncomfortable so that my body will know how to perform it even when I'm uncomfortable. The video is prior, a session. Prior Just session. Any back. prior session over with him. Other questions about this? It's kind of a strange thing, so we usually gotta I gotta clarify a few things for it to make sense. Now you'll notice as I say it, I'm saying it slightly differently each time because I don't want to turn into a therapy robot. And so right now, where do you notice the anxiety just physically in your body? That's the somatic anxiety regulation technique. So right, right here, right there, do you notice where in your body do you physically notice the anxiety? See, I'm kind of switching up my words and intonation. I'm kind of playing with it. Just right now, we we'll just pause you for a moment. Where physically do you notice the anxiety in your body? I, I'm trying, I'm trying to like make it my own. And so right now, just where physically do you notice the anxiety in your body right now? Any questions? Yes. Do you pick? I know you just said it's kind of any take, but do you pick a particular one that, like, there's maybe a session where you felt like you missed it, or you felt like you're a little bit more uncomfortable? Yeah. So if there was a moment where I felt more uncomfortable, I would do that. Okay. With him, I was missing his disassociation from the moment he sat down. Okay. So I just started from the beginning. Okay. Now, if uh, we were doing deliberate practice around the exposure, great. We might go to that part of the tape. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So now, so that is one of the skills I'm working on is an interpersonal skill of using this anxiety regulation technique with the client. And you can tell it's not super complicated or difficult or whatever. Right? There's something else I'm doing as well. I'm working on an inner skill, which is trying to identify and label my internal experiences while I watch the video and rehearse. Because some, remember, something was blocking my awareness of the client. I was having counter-transference slash experiential avoidance. I want to figure out what that was. So you'll see, after I say the line, I pause. And in the pause, I do an internal scan. Okay, so let's watch that. And so right now, just where physically did you feel this anxiety? It's the interpersonal, and right now I'm practicing the inner skill of self-reflection. And so just right here, just where physically do you notice this anxiety in your body? Interpersonal, intrapersonal, or inner. And so just right now, in your body, where do you physically notice the anxiety? Intra or inner. Any questions about that? Now to help this client, I'm gonna to have to be able to do both with him. Right? I got I gotta help him, of course, but I also gotta stay grounded in myself, which I've been losing. 
So I'm rehearsing them right close to each other. All right? It's kind of like, uh, you know, your soccer coach might have you do these drills where you, uh, you know, kick, you try to score, and then you run back and forth across the field. And then you score, and then run back and forth across the field. Uh, hockey coaches are particularly famous for having the players just do these like exhausting like skates back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then shoot. Right? Because the coach knows you you got to be able to shoot and score even while you're exhausted. <laughs> right? Like that's who wins the games. Right? So they combine the physical conditioning with the skills training. The internal skill, think of it as, uh, it's like physical conditioning, but it's psychological conditioning. Right? I don't have to be in great physical shape to do therapy, but I do have to be self-reflective. Even when I'm sitting with a client who I find a body. Any questions about that? So I uh, did this for 20 minutes at a time. I'm not going to make you watch 20 minutes of it. It would be incredibly boring. Uh, First time I did it for 20 minutes, I uh, noticed very little. Uh, I, in fact, the only thing I really noticed internally was like a numbness. Some thoughts of annoyance, uh, some self-doubt, but just typically like a numbness. I did it again a few days later for 20 minutes and noticed something different. It's the exact same exercise. I noticed uh, a more generalized tension around my whole body kind of a tightness, shortness of breath, the self-doubt was stronger. There was some like shame, embarrassment, like, oh, you know, maybe I'm not good enough to help this client, maybe I shouldn't be a therapist, that kind of thing. I did it a third time a few days later for 20 minutes, and this time was very different. This time I noticed acute tension uh, in my legs, feet, arms, hands, that kind of went inwards, it got stronger and stronger, after maybe about 10 minutes, um, got very uncomfortable. I had very pronounced self-doubt, embarrassment, shame, like avoidance, like, oh, I don't want to do this. As I persisted, I just started having these images of myself, young age, and I was like, oh my god, this client was like me. When I was a teenager, I had dysregulated anxiety and I was disassociated. And no one around me knew really what to do or identify. I like, got kicked out of a high school and dropped out of another high school and I was a mess. And then I just had these like waves of grief. I could feel it as I'm talking. Just this sadness for the client and myself. And then compassion for the client and myself. And this was the countertransference or experiential avoidance that was blocking me. Because I had been fighting it off without realizing it. And so for the last 10 minutes of the third session, I just sat there crying. Even while I was sitting there at the, looking at the screen, saying these words, I was crying, like at the same time. Like if you had walked in, it would have looked like really strange. <laughs> but you might have noticed psychotherapy is kind of an odd profession. <laughs> so we kind of get used to it. Uh, um, and it, next time I sat down with a client, it was very different. I was able to notice myself starting to numb out. I was able to notice him disassociated, even before he sat in the chair, just coming in the room, he was disassociated. I was able to ground myself, and then I was able to help him ground himself. And we had a very different experience. This was a few years ago. I actually got an email from him a month ago. Uh, he just wanted to let me know how well he was doing. It was really cool. Like he had achieved all these goals he had been talking about. I mean, it was really amazing. You know, we get these emails sometimes, it's just, it's so heartwarming. Um, any questions about the process? Yes? Are you normally working on the delivery of one specific theme, or is it more like just in a theme, trying to? Great question. So, and I'm going to go over, I'll answer that briefly now, mm -hmm. and then go over it more after the break. Actually, you know what? Can we take a break and save the question? Because then I can really dive into it. With it. Okay, because that's where I'm going next, actually. Uh, great, well, why don't we take a break? Um, we've got time. Do uh, you want to maybe, is 10 minutes enough? Is that okay? Okay, so we'll be back at two. Is it Daniel? Is that okay? Yes. Okay, Daniel. Uh, your question,
Can you just ask your question again? Sure. So do you focus on the delivery of kind of a single thing, or do you stick with like a theme? Yeah. So uh, this is kind of my model for using deliver practice, where I focus on three domains. Okay. Uh, or, or, well, let me put it this way. I can focus on three domains. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we just focus on one, depending on the training. Right? I, I don't want to flood someone, so sometimes one is enough. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes one is kind of too easy, so we add more. Now, I'll kind of explain this to you, but I want you to know, this is just my informal way of doing deliberate practice that I've kind of come up with over the past few years. This is not empirically validated. This is, you know, we've we got to do a lot more research. There's also a number of other psychologists who are doing really good work on how can we use deliberate practice. Has anyone heard of Scott Miller? So he was the first psychologist uh, to really promote the idea of, uh, of using deliberate practice in psychotherapy. Franz Casper was the first psychologist to write about it. Uh, but Scott Miller has been going around giving talks about this for, I think, a decade or more. Has anyone heard of Bruce Wampold? So he's a big common factors researcher. He also has a model for using deliberate practice. And so if you're interested in it, I would uh, kind of look up what they're doing. Uh, they're also, they're both, you know, rigorous researchers. Uh, so they're, they're doing good stuff. Uh, they're included at the end of the slides is a list of resources of pe other people who are doing uh, deliberate practice stuff. Um, so there's also Daryl Chow. Anyone heard of him? He's done a bunch in this. Uh, John Fredericks. Anyways, there's a, there's a list of people. So these are the domains that I personally have divided up into. The first is interpersonal skills. Uh, these can also uh, be called kind of common factor skills. People have heard the term common factors, I presume, here you guys learn about that stuff. It's also helping skills or facilitative interpersonal skills. Uh, alliance focused training. You guys have, I'm sure, learned about the working alliance. Um, these are the skills that research has most reliably associated with effective therapy. All right? This is one of the most um, uh, supported or confirmed findings in psych psychotherapy over the past three, four, five decades is that these skills are key to effective therapy. All right? So we can focus on these skills. That's one domain. So um, in, in, in the back, you asked about the skill of kind of basically asking for information from someone who's guarded. I'd say, you know, that could be an interpersonal skill, right? I mean, another, another way related to that would be building trust with someone who's fearful, right? I mean, maybe he or she had a bad experience with a previous therapist, or I don't know, who knows, right? Okay. The second domain is specific model skills. Now, you see, that I just put some of the alphabet soup of, you know, therapies here. There are many, many more. Uh, each of these models has specific skills within the model, right? So for cognitive processing therapy, there's specific skills you're supposed to be adherent to, right? Uh, for psychodynamic, for every model, right? Now, in this domain, the research is a lot less strong. In fact, there's a lot of questions about whether specific ingredients from specific models contribute to better outcomes. There's a fair amount of debate about that. However, there is almost no debate that therapists should work from a model. All right? If you tell your supervisor, oh, I'm just going to show up and wing it, just be a nice person, uh, you're not going to get good marks for that. <laughs> right? That's typically not going to help. Typically, your clients already have a friend or someone who's a nice person to them. And they're, com they're, they're coming to you because that wasn't enough. Right? So. Uh, so we can rehearse skills, if nothing else, to help you feel comfortable in the cognitive framework of therapy. Okay? We just don't want to. We don't want to idolize specific models because uh, that's been done before. Any questions so far? The third domain 
is intrapersonal or inner skills. Now these have been called like self-awareness, mindfulness, mentalization, meta-psychological capacity. Anyone recognize these terms? So these are all, these are not just things you help the client do, but theoretically the therapist should be able to do it as well. Right, going back to Freud, the various teachers have said it's important that therapists are self-reflective. It's important that therapists uh, are able to mentalize, so on and so forth. However, unfortunately, no one has provided a plan for how to achieve that. Except, what, what do you think, if you go to your supervisor and you say, oh, I'm feeling so much distressed about this client, uh, I think, in fact, the client activates something from my childhood. I'm losing my self-reflective capacity. What will your supervisor say? Go to therapy. Go to therapy. That has been our go-to uh, thing for the past 100 years. Now, I'm all for trainees, therapists doing their own therapy. I've done many years of my own therapy. I still do my own therapy. I, I fully support that. However, I have not found it to be sufficient. Are you guys mandated to do your own therapy here? Okay. Strongly encouraged. Strongly encouraged. That's what many programs do. The problem with mandating it is, you know, if someone doesn't want to go, making them go doesn't help anyone. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's kind of silly. Uh, it's also an issue, this is technically a rural area, right? Or not really? Are we close enough to the cities? It's not? Okay. I know, I worked in the uh, middle of Alaska, Fairbanks for a while. That was definitely a rural area. <laughs> middle of nowhere and it was a real issue for trainees that wanted to do their own therapy because there were like 10 psychologists in town like literally when I left there was then like nine like and so and most of us worked at the university so they would be in training with us or we'd be their faculty or whatever so or they if they go to therapy with someone in town when they graduate they, they might want to you know be a colleague or work in the same office I mean it's a real issue so it's not a, and also the money, it's not an easy thing for graduate students to go to therapy. I would suggest that psychological training should be part of your clinical training. In the same way, if you were training to become a professional athlete, they wouldn't say, okay, so what's necessary to play in the NBA is you have to be peak physical fitness. So go do that and then come back when you're at peak physical fitness and we'll teach you how to play basketball. They don't do that, they, they integrate it from the very beginning. In fact, every new move you learn as an athlete requires a new kind of fitness. Right? I would suggest the same thing. Every new, psych, every new therapy technique you learn requires a new kind of psychological awareness for what it's gonna produce in both the client and you. There's some cool quotes here uh, from recent research that's shown that a person's capacity for empathy is tightly related to their capacity for their own emotional regulation. Right? So if my wife says, Tony, I had a hard day at work, my colleague was being a jerk, I can feel a fair amount of empathy. If she says, Tony, my day was really hard because you didn't do the dishes even though you promised you, you would and now I'm really questioning our marriage, my empathy capacity starts <laughs> dropping <laughs> precipitously. <laughs> right? <laughs> and yet that's what we're dealing with with clients. When therapy's not working, a lot of clients, and a lot of times it's true, it's because we're not doing our job well. As therapists, it's personal, it's about us. So we can feel threatened. So the quote is, uh, keep high levels of vicarious emotional arousal from turning into personal distress. I would suggest most people are like maybe a one or a two out of 10 at being able to do that. Most therapists are maybe a three. I would propose we aim through a training regimen to get all therapists up to a seven or a higher.
Here's another one. Ability to focus and shift our attention to modulate their negative vicarious emotion emotions to maintain an optimal level of emotional arousal. So how confident do you feel about your ability to maintain an optimal level of emotional arousal when your clients are angry at you? Or saying therapy's not helpful, they want to quit. Or so on and so forth. Right? That's what this domain is about. Any questions about that? So, I would now like to, let's see, how are we gonna do this? Let's do this. I'd like to do two group exercises so everyone gets a chance to try it themselves, okay? I'm going to play uh, two videos. The videos show actors uh, portraying challenging moments in therapy. While you watch, I'm going to ask you to try to notice three areas of your inner experience. Can you see these, or is they too small? Or emotions? The second is body sensations. And the third is urges. Urges would be like look away, disengage, something like that. All right? So I'm going to show you the video, and then I'm going to try to ask you to write down what you notice. You're not, I'm not going to ask you to share with the group. Okay? And you're going to keep it private. I'm not going to collect it or anything like that. All right? Any questions about that? You're going to be practicing self-reflective capacity. Look, I, I don't want to be rude, but I'm just, I'm not sure that therapy is helping. Now, I, I, I felt better when we started a few months ago, but now I just, I feel worse. And I know that you're trying, but do, do you really think that this is helping? And how, how do you know for sure? My, my friend told me that, that her therapist is very reassuring. And uh, I don't know, sometimes I just, sometimes I feel like you don't understand me at all. And I, I understand, I know that you are pretty new to this. I, are, are you absolutely sure that you can help me? Because sometimes I wonder if I felt better just because just because I expected therapy to help. I mean, my girlfriend even said that therapy is just a placebo, and at first I, I said it wasn't, but I don't know. I mean, now, now I'm really wondering how much this can really help me. I didn't tell you this earlier because I, I, cause I, I do like you. I like you as a person, and I know that you are trying, but right now I just really need to know how sure you are that therapy can help me. Because this this costs a lot of money. Great. Okay. It's funny when we got this uh, video made. It was a production company in L.A. And we didn't expect him to be so attractive. <laughs> it was an out of work soap opera actor or something like that. So some people find it a little distracting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, first of all, uh, how difficult, how uncomfortable did that feel within you? Zero to ten. Just write it down. And, and now, separately, how difficult was it to remember to track your inner experience and not get caught up in him and what he's saying and you know all that zero to ten and now uh, Try to write down any thoughts or emotions you noticed. And there's some up here, hopefully it's not too small fun. 
These are common ones. And now, when you're done with that, write down any body sensations you noticed. And then A, urge. Now, I'm not going to ask people to disclose, you know, their answers, but I would guess that if we kind of, you know, surveyed the room, we would see a wide variety of answers. Some people report watching this video as like not distressing at all. Some people are like, whoa, it's really distressing. Other people say, oh, it's so easy. I was totally aware of my inner world. Other people are like, I just got totally caught up in what he was saying. I totally forgot I was supposed to track any of it. Some people are like, I noticed that, 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 that. Other people are like, can name like two reactions. It's just totally, totally personal. In the same way, uh, if, if imagine if I came in here and I said, hey, I found this new empirically validated way of getting in shape. It's called weightlifting. <laughs> Here's a hundred pound weight. I want everyone in the room to do 10 curls. Some of you might benefit from that. Some of you would not, right? Really what we would want to do is sit you down in the gym and help have you do weights until we find out what your particular skill threshold is. And it's just very personal. It has to do with you know, your body size, your all kinds of things, right? There's no kind of right and wrong, it's just personal. And the same with this. And that's one of the principles of deliberate practice is we want to really personalize it. And I'm gonna show you when we do, uh, with Jabin, when we do the uh, individual demonstration. I'm going to show you how to personalize it. Okay? But the idea with this exercise would be to do it enough, assuming that it's below an 8 in difficulty. If it's above an 8, you could get hurt. Okay? On the other hand, if it's below a 4, it's not really helping. It's kind of like you go to the gym for an hour, but if you leave without sweating, you're not getting any benefit. Right? So we want it somewhere right in here. And we want reactions on this side. These reactions typically indicate someone's getting flooded, and it's hard to learn when you're flooded. I personally have had almost, I've had all of these reactions, and I have personally had almost all of these reactions during my own training, in retrospect. In retrospect, a fair amount of my training, I was over here. And you know, I was just kind of go along because that's what I was meant to do, but I was not benefiting. We did some role plays, we watched some videos that were just too too much for me. Right? It didn't mean there's anything bad about me, it just meant it was an inappropriate training exercise for me. And unfortunately, the culture of psychotherapy training right now is not really personalized. So uh, we're, we're, we're trying to make this more personal. Any questions? about this. Were you surprised about how easy or hard it was for you? Okay, let's try another one. This is a different video. Now, we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to watch the video. I think this video is a little shorter. And remember, try to track your inner experience. And if you can, at least one or two reactions under all three categories, thoughts, feelings, body sensations, behavioral origins. Okay? Any questions before I get started? I want you to know that you've been very helpful to me. We have only been meeting for a few weeks and you've helped me way more than my previous therapists. How do you understand me so well? It's like you can read my mind. Yeah? You're very insightful. What am I thinking about right now? It's a shame that I met you as my therapist. 
because you're the kind of person I've been looking for as a partner. Sometimes I wonder what it would be like if we were together. The other night I hooked up with a girl I met at a bar. And when we were together, I thought about you. I hope you don't judge me for thinking about you. And I know you have to be professional, but sometimes I wonder if you think about me too. I know you can't answer me that, and that's okay. Because honestly, it's more fun having a secret, isn't it? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different video. <coughs> I first, the first time I first said that, someone was like, can we watch it again? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first of all, how uncomfortable did it make you feel? Zero to ten. I, I know this topic, the first time I had a client who was attracted to me, I just was like, blown out of the way. I mean, I was so uncomfortable. So uncomfortable. Uh, and I didn't want to talk about supervision. I was just like it, horrified by the, you know, the whole thing. So I was just kind of paralyzed. Uh, okay. And then zero to 10, how hard was it for you to track your inner experience rather than get caught up in the video? Now remember, these are both situations that will inevitably happen to every therapist. If you practice long enough, you will have a client who's frustrated at you and a client who's attracted to you. Guaranteed. And now, can you uh, label uh, any thoughts or emotions you had? Yes, please. For this second question, do you want to clarify how difficult was it to not be in touch with your personal experience, or how di how difficult was it to be too in touch with your personal experience? To be in touch. So, how difficult was it to track okay. your internal reactions, rather than get like caught up in the video? And note any body sensations. And then any urges. Great. Did how would people compare this uh, video stimulus to the others or the exercise? Any differences? The second one was less threatening for me. Less threatening? The first one, I think, taps into uh, perhaps some concerns I have. <laughs> Great. So personal reactions. <laughs> yep. You see how it really depends on your personal history. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that was similar for me. The first one was more because these are some of the challenges we see every day, and yep. we're like, how to handle that. Yep. Second one actually happened with me, so oh. I, this time I was better focused oh. and able to manage that. Oh, okay, cool. Anyone else? Yes? I think for me the second was harder, because I've had the first one so many times ah, that I'm okay. really exposed to it. The second one has only happened once, so yeah. it wasn't that overt, so it was much more like, oh, we yeah. Are really now there's also gender differences. I mean, there's all kinds of differences, right? So, um, so what we were working on there were intrapersonal skills, right? Now what we could also rehearse is interpersonal. So what do you say in these situations, mm. right? So how do you repair with the first client, or how do you set boundaries, you know, in a respectful way with the second client, right? So ideally, we would have you know a library of a hundred different videos that we could rehearse different skills with. 
All right. Uh, any last questions about this before we move into the individual demo? Yeah. 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 Y